Welcome back to Grit Gym, guys. I've got Michael Boyle with me today. Uh, Mike Boyle is Mike Boyle Strength Conditioning. Uh, I think it's I think it's fair to say like probably legendary status in the strength conditioning world at this point. The biggest guest that we've had on the Grit Gym show so far. So I'm really excited to, to sit down and talk with him. And uh, I've really got to kind of like check my ego a little bit because uh, I'm going to try to disagree with the Michael Boyle about Olympic lifting in a, in a discussion that we're going to have here in a second. But uh, coach, I don't I, like for me, like, I don't think you really need a ton of introduction just because like you've been such a, uh, you, have, you have such a following and you, you've been so good for the strength conditioning community, but can you kind of tell people a little bit about what you do and how you got started? Yeah. Cause I think you, you'd said this is probably 90% more general population folks. So if the, we were going out to strength coaches, I might at least, Assume that some of them know who I am, but I would say most of these people have no idea and are looking and saying, who is this old guy here? So I am 58 years old. I have been doing this for, um, well, God, I can't even, if I, I guess I'm, I'm pushing on 40 years now. I'm probably 36 years of actually coaching people. I started when I was 21 at Boston University. I started in strength and conditioning when strength and conditioning didn't exist, really. I started in personal training when personal training didn't exist, really. So I've been doing this stuff really before most people thought about it, even as the fact that you could make money at it. And when I started, I didn't make any money at it. It's, uh, well, it was, uh, 10 years ago, doing this, it wasn't a thing. It wasn't, it was barely a thing. Yeah. Um, 30, Let's say 36 years ago when I started, I still remember I had two friends from Springfield College who got part-time strength and conditioning jobs. Really? And I thought, wow, these guys, the, these my two friends went on to become the two longest tenured strength coaches in the National Football League, Mike Wojcik and Rusty Jones. But at the time we were leaving Springfield College, they had both gotten kind of dual role jobs where they had to do something else while they were the strength coach. But I thought that was the coolest thing ever. It was someone was actually getting paid to do this. Yeah, it's awesome. It's uh, it's amazing. So yeah, like you did, like it, like you guys are definitely like pioneers in the. Uh, well, I, I guess you call it an industry at this point, but uh, but like uh, what what was the uh, what was it like back then versus what is it like now? Well, I mean, it's funny. Someone asked me, you know, sort of what was the what do you remember as the greatest technological development? And I'm like the computer. So, <laughs> I mean, when we started out doing it, the computer room was probably about as big as the room that you're in. Yeah. And we were punching holes in cards to run them through a computer to analyze data or something like that. So the thought that we could sit here and that I could talk to you, we had to we had to read books. Uh, we had to go to a library and look at what they called microfiche at that time. So you'd kind of go and look at these little reels of microfilm that might have – Video. I remember we're looking for Olympic lifting video and going on and and having to go and look at these you know microfiche and put it in these readers and watch it. So I mean, it, it was so completely and utterly different from the way it is now in terms of there were no twenty year old experts. At least if they were, we didn't know they were there because they weren't bothering us from someplace else because we couldn't see them. And if anybody had done anything of consequence, it probably meant that they had written a book. And now I realize even in the process of writing a book, God, but books, I would say books by the time you get them are at least two or three years out of date. And so God knows what sort of information we were working off of at that time. The best thing, the best source of information were uh, muscle magazines, things like Muscle and Fitness, Strength and Health, Iron Man. That was where you were getting relatively real time information. And those were probably the big drivers in the field at that time. Yeah. And I mean, and now that now we consider those like, like by the time they they might you know they're out of date by the time they get to you because the internet's just right and, and the fact that now I mean who bothers to actually read a magazine I don't know there are, I think there are not a whole lot of people I still am a book reader I will definitely read books but it would be rare that I would read a magazine unless I was sort of stuck in a waiting room or on an airplane or something like that but yeah like you might look at the pictures but I suppose yeah. Right. Yeah, I actually, uh, I don't know about you, but like reading off of a tablet or reading off a computer, like it just bugs me. Like I, I like to have a page, you know, mm-hmm. unless I just sit there and scribble on. Yeah, well, that, that's kind of old age, just so you know, because uh, my son watches TV on his phone as opposed to watching. We have a, whatever, a 50-inch TV, and he sits there like this with his phone and looks at his phone, which I consider to be the most bizarre behavior possible. 
Yeah. <laughs> I think that's where it's going though. Like what happens when it's just Oh yeah, with no question. I mean, that's why we're doing this stuff and that's why when I get the opportunity to do this stuff I do because this is absolutely where it's going and if you can I was having this conversation with um actually with my son's lacrosse coaches because they're really good lacrosse coaches. They've got a, a nice little select lacrosse program going, but their social media footprint is horrible in terms of they had like an Instagram account with 300 followers that they haven't posted on in a month. And they had a Facebook page, same thing, you know, that they hadn't posted on since November. Yeah. And I was trying to explain to them that guys, this is your outreach. This is your advertising. This is your vehicle to get to clients. And I think, People in their 40s and 50s, if they're not, I guess if they're not really good about studying, can really get lost. All of a sudden, you're you're lost in the wilderness. You don't have any way to contact customers, any way to advertise because you're not internet savvy. Yeah, yeah. And besides, even if you if you you can look at it at that point, and you can also we were talking about this the other day in the gym with a bunch of people because I try to hit the social media thing hard, but mine comes from almost like a point of like idealism, like. This is your ability to put a good message out, you know, put good information out, and and and, uh, and give something back, you know. Yeah, uh, and, but but the reality is, it's it's not. It is your advertising vehicle. It's the only thing that you have right now. When you think, imagine if I said, Adam, gee, I want you to run some ads in the local paper. You'd laugh. Yeah, you yeah. just right. You just be like, well, that's absurd. Why would I do that? But yeah, think I, about how people used to try to get customers. Nobody like the papers dying. The, uh, the like you just said, nobody reads magazines. You know, like uh, unless you have some kind of presence on the internet, it's probably not going to be a thing. You know? Yeah. And if you're not putting out a good message, like even if you're putting out a bad message, some people are getting attention. So it's like uh, if uh, if no one's willing to go ahead and step up that that has educated themselves and continues to learn and continues to to think of new innovative uh, kind of ways to make it better, then what's going to end up? You know, I don't know. <laughs> Well, it's the same progression if you really look at it. I, I use like professional wrestling as a perfect example in terms of professional wrestling is really big on television. There's lots of people that watch it, yet we all know that it, that it's fake and that it's kind of an odd product, but it has a huge following. The internet, the, the big superstars on the internet on Instagram, the big superstars on YouTube are not people like us. They're not people who know anything about fitness. They're people with abs who make videos of themselves doing ridiculous things. But they're the ones that are making millions and getting product placement and generating all these hits and likes and all that stuff. And it's a bunch of idiots like us. We're sort of playing in the shallow end of the pool somewhere without a lot of knowledge, but realizing how oh, we have to be in here. Like, I got to kind of be in the water. And there's some other guy like out in a yacht out there who's saying, oh, yeah, I'm 25 years old. And, you know, I got 20 million followers because I'm ripped. Yeah. So it, that, I think the reality of it doesn't change just the vehicle. Yeah, I do too. And and I don't have anything against that kid that's able to pull that off. It's just kind of an interesting thing. I do. World. I have something against him, but it's okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, with Olympic lifting, uh, we, we said we were going to talk about Olympic lifting. You kind of brought up when, when you were learning about Olympic lifting, the biggest educational thing that you had was the, what would you call them? The fish? Like the what, – what kind of film? The fish film? Is oh, that micro, Microfiche. With micro F I C H E microfiche. They were like little films. I don't know. They they had these little readers in the library. I I guess the closest thing would be sort of a, like a reel to reel tape. Yeah. But they weren't really like that. They were little. They were smaller than that. And you kind of wind. You they had little readers that you put them in. And you versus click on button on YouTube. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so like uh, like back then like uh, I mean even I mean. Uh, I was in my, uh, I was in college in, uh, what was that? Oh my God. It's been a little while now. Uh, like 11 years ago, I, I'm graduated. I'm graduated college. We're still doing all sorts of Olympic lifts along the way. Um, we're still doing, we're seeing a ton of Olympic lifting done in industry conditioning. Is there kind of a, like in where you are with all the studying that you've done, have you come to a conclusion that Olympic lifting should be used across the board or for every single person or that it, there are certain people that it's inappropriate for and people that it is appropriate for. Well, it's interesting because, and you said so, 90% of the people that are viewing are normal adults, then 90% of the people that are viewing shouldn't be doing Olympic lifting. So I look at it and think I, I'm sort of completely kind of anti the whole CrossFit idea. 
I don't think that adults, and I've written this, adults make very bad Olympic lifters. People that have been sitting down for a really long time and can't reach their hands up over their head are going to be terrible Olympic weightlifters. Right. As a result, our adult population, our general population stuff is zero Olympic weightlifting. No, I wouldn't say zero. Maybe 2% because we do have some, you know, this small number of ex-jocks who are really like, hey, I really want to do cleans. And, and in they that- grew up doing it probably. I mean, they probably, they probably have a, a, a mass. Like if you – like I've done a ton of Olympic lifting. I, I would have no problem throwing off a snatch right now. Uh, and I, you know, I'm almost 33 years old. Uh, so I don't think it's that big of a deal. But to a 55-year-old mom who's never lifted a day in her life. Yeah, it's stupid. I mean, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even consider it. Yet, yeah. on the flip side, I consider it absolutely vital. Not vital, but I think it's one of the best things a young athlete can do. I think it's when we start with kids, it's one of the first things that we teach them because I do think it's really athletic and really coordinated. There's so much value to it for a young developing athlete. So I guess I have almost completely divergent opinions. You know, on one hand, I've got this, hey, never with adults. And on the other hand, I would say absolutely always with kids. So, so I, I think that the continuum. So when you get an athlete in, if that, like, let's say they don't have the shoulder flexion to pull it off, they've got, you know, they're, they're stuck and they can't extend their upper back because of strength, mobility restriction, whatever it is. Um, and, uh, I don't know. And they don't have like a decent amount of foundational strength to actually get anything out of it. Are you working towards that or are you just throwing them, throwing them in? We're working toward, well, generally what we do is we start with hand cleans with everybody, which I think is an easier lift for everybody to learn. So we don't have to worry about overhead mobility. So we don't have to, you know, we're not doing bar snatches. We're not doing push jerks. So we start and then our introduction to overhead work will usually be dumbbell snatch, which I always think, Gives you a lot more degrees of freedom, so somebody can kind of figure a way to weasel their way into a dumbbell snatch position a lot easier than they could with a bar snatch. And then, if we get to bar snatch down the road and they can't do it, we don't. So I, I think there is this there is a process that allows us to get there that really centers around learning to hand clean. Yeah, and when you put when you talk about Olympic lifting, are you talking? Just barbell snatch, barbell jerk, barbell clean uh, from the floor, or are you putting hang cleans, uh, kettlebell clean, uh, like a, a one dumbbell jerk, uh, one dumbbell snatch? Are you putting all of them in that category? Uh, in, in, it's interesting for us, not really in the sense that we only, we never Olympic lift off the floor. I'm not a fan of Olympic lifting from the floor, and I've always argued with people in terms of the disc is a constant. So okay. if you go to the floor, everybody is forced to lift from a certain height off the floor, which yeah. doesn't make sense. It doesn't work well. It only works well for shorter people. Right. So we've always been hang clean above the knee people, hang snatch above the knee people. Right. We only post grip snatch. We will not, we do not snatch grip snatch. We yeah. don't hit squat and really we don't jerk at all. We don't do any kind of any variations of push jerks. Cause I found at least with my, even with my athletes, when I started, my athletes could generate too much lower body power and get far more weight over their head than I ever wanted them to be able to. And as a result, they couldn't get it down again. So we would get some guys, you know, back in our football days that could really jerk. Yeah. And then it would be just scary watching them try to get the bar back down. Somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, when I was in college, we would just walk out from underneath it. And I mean, you got about college kids. I mean, 10% of them were probably sitting there lifting drunk and, uh, <laughs> And it's just, uh, it is, I mean, you might have 300 pounds up above your head. Yeah. I, I remember I cleaned, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't like an insane number. I, I, I think it was 275. It was enough to be scary, right? I cleaned 275 and my foot hit, uh, a puddle, like a, like a little bit of sweat on the floor, slipped out and the whole thing came on me. And I mean, like, granted, all I did was hit the floor because the plate stopped it, but uh, it was terrifying. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we've had, when I was a college strength coach, we had unfortunately too many of those where, you know, guys going over backwards and yeah. that's why. And so as a result, I, I sort of, it's like we have this little sphere of Olympic lifting that we kind of believe in. And it's really, you know, the, the classically trained Olympic lifter would not like what we're doing. We, no. have, you know, we yeah. do single leg cleans when we have people that are hurt, which drives the Olympic lifting people nuts. And we've done single leg bar snatches. 
So I think sometimes, you know, we've extended our philosophy into um, our Olympic lifting too. So I think my thing is always to use the tool in the safest way possible in terms of I always use the chainsaw analogy. If we're going to use a chainsaw, I want the chainsaw to be used for the right job and to be used really safely. Whereas if I look at the CrossFitter, it's like clean is their chainsaw and they're going to give the chainsaw to children, moms, grandmother, doesn't matter who it is. Just, you know, yeah. and they're, they're yeah. going to get them really tired before they give them that chainsaw. Yes. Or get them really tired while they have it. Like just keep <laughs> swinging that thing around. Don't worry about it. Yeah. You, you've got two legs. I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like, uh, like I think people are very romantic about this, this, like this style of lifting. This, like Olympic lifting, uh, you know, the sort of thing that, well, it has to be the traditional, you know, I don't know if romance is the, is the right word, but it's like, they just want to cling to it so bad that you always have to take a power queen from the floor instead of a hang queen. You're missing out on. That's what you think. Maybe dogmatic is a better word than romantic. Yeah. But I think, yeah. I Thank think you. that's our field because that's back squat. That's it, most people are very invested in whatever they like. I always use the same. I always use the same absurd analogy when I talk. I tell people that I really like Bud Light and chocolate chip ice cream. But if people ask me for nutrition advice, I do not look at them and say Bud Light and chocolate chip ice cream. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. But in our field, that's what people do in terms of people are very invested in what they do. Yeah. And as a result, they just tell everybody, oh, do what I do without any regard for whether or not that's appropriate for them. And, and then they make up excuses about, well, you should be able to do this, or if you really practice, or if you really do this, or if you really do that, instead of just looking like, I look, my pet peeve is that I got, I try to stay out of the internet debates, but whenever anybody writes the, there are no bad lifts. <laughs> I was, yes, there are actually, there's a bunch yeah. of really bad lifts. I would tell you that behind the neck presses are bad. Dips yeah. are bad. I think right. the back squats are bad. Like there are things that, there are lifts that I just don't think are good choices for anybody. Yeah, they're injury in the group. Yeah, and and that's so. I think it's the same thing. And then, well, you know, if if the right person doing it the right way, I'm like, yeah, that's absolutely true. But that's not that yeah. does not make the lift good if one percent or two percent or ten percent of the people about an outlier at that point. And yeah. like if you're applying your your program across, you know, for an outlier, then you just left off this entire demographic of people, and right. you get a bunch of people hurt. And that's where the 80-20 principle is a, is a really good thing. And you start looking at that and realizing that if you if you're if sort of your exception is in the 20, you're okay. If your exception is in the 80, then you're probably doing the wrong things. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's one of our things too. Like uh, when I was going along with this, like like we used to do Olympic lifts with every you know with all the athletes that I was working with 10 years ago. It was, it was like we were working towards doing Olympic lifting, and all the general population people I had were working towards Olympic lifting. And then uh, like I, I was beating my head against the wall trying to get, you know, the learning curve was so long, and the uh, the fact they they probably did like looking back, I was just making a lot of mistakes, but I was learning, and. Uh, they didn't have the foundational strength. They didn't have the mobility. They didn't have, the, you know, the, like almost everybody didn't have something that would make them a good Olympic lifter. So we started doing things like just jumping with the barbell in their hands, you know, from a hang position uh, instead of a full on snatch or, or, or clean. I mean, we just went with our adults. We just, we just jump. <laughs> we don't have anything in their hands. And yeah, we too. Everybody, everybody does plyos. Everybody jumps. Everybody hops. Everybody bounds. We do a lot of medicine ball throwing. I think there's ways to get your velocity training. If you say, I want to do high velocity training, I want to train somebody's nervous system, there's a bunch of ways to do it. If you said to me, what's the best way, given all of these things being equal, you know, somebody with the, you know, sort of the right joints and the right mobility, all that, I'd say Olympic lifting. But if you said to me, you know, analyze the risk benefit of that, I'd be like, well, it depends. You know, do you, how old are you? Do you have to go to work? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like there's things when you've got young people with no jobs, if they get hurt lifting, it's not as big a crisis yeah. as when you have like an older person who has to go to work and suddenly they're laying on your floor with a back spasm or they've hurt their wrist or they've hurt their shoulder. And you're thinking, gee, this really sucks. You can't go to work today. You're, you might get fired. Your family might lose their jaw, you know, their house. You might not eat. There's, there's a lot of reality to adults. Like two to three months, whereas the kid is going to be like, uh, going to be feel a little banged up for three days. Yeah. 
Right. And that's I because I have, I mean, I have a 19, 18 year old daughter and a 13 year old son. And I've seen it myself in terms of kids. My son will be complaining about something. And two hours later, how's your shoulder? How's your elbow? Oh, it's good. It's fine. And I look at him and think, if I did what you did, I'd be, I'd be hurt forever. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we see some of our, uh, we do, we do a lot of lateral lunges in here. Uh, and for some of our high school kids, especially, we'll wait it up. And I see some of the girls go down to all the, I mean, just all the way down their heel. They, you know, they got that real shallow hip socket that they can do that. And it's like, my femur would be over there. Like it, it just, my hip would be busted in half if I tried to do that. I mean, that's, it's just, and that I always use, I use the analogy of beef jerky and filet mignon for people all the time. When people say, why don't you do it? I said, just so that you understand, I said, those kids over there, that's filet mignon. This guy sitting here, this is beef jerky. If I showed you the two, do you see the difference? One is really crusty and hard and dehydrated, and one is really supple and really well hydrated. And, and you couldn't pull it apart if you wanted to. If I gave you uncooked filet and said, rip it apart with your hands, no chance. <laughs> I give you beef jerky, you're like, you want a piece here? Yeah. And that really is example. the aging process in a very sort of microcosmic analogy. Yeah. Yeah. Very, I'll end up I might have to steal that one from you. Just, I've probably heard that like a dozen times, and I just now I'm like just like this. Yeah, just try to just try to give me credit once the first time you do it, and then after that you can say it was your. Yeah. <laughs> you're just a one time. Uh, like, okay, I can deal with that. But uh, what like with uh, so if we're gonna so with Olympic lifting, if you want to go toward it's, uh, talking about you know, we have a thoracic mobility or a thoracic stability or even a strength uh, restriction or an elbow wrist or uh, that kind of thing. Like, do you have any trouble with the clean, the compression down here or the wrist flopping over or the, the valgus stress of the, of the snatch? I would say we don't get the valgus stretch because we close grip snatch. So we okay. straight over. Yeah. So that never becomes a problem. I yeah. think the biggest thing that we do see is that whatever – that upper body flexibility component, an upper body mobility component, whether it's T-spine, whether it's shoulder, whether it's wrist, whether it's elbow. But in all honesty, I would say that might be less than 5% of the athletes that we see and yeah. that we kind of get past that relatively quickly. It actually becomes really rare that I think we get a kid and say, yeah, this kid really isn't going to be able to do this. And a lot of times if they don't have that, kind of wrist shoulder flexibility, a lot of times they do end up being able to close grip snatch or dumbbell snatch and they're fine. So yeah. it, there's always kind of quick defaults. And the way our system is, is set up, it's very much sort of progression regression based. And okay, if you can't do this, then you do this. Right. And there are people like we've been playing around lately because I have uh, professional baseball players with trap bar jumps and dumbbell jumps, things that I didn't do before. I'm starting to say, okay, I still would like to do, I look at this, so I, I would create, the category in my mind is loaded power. Sure. And how am I going to do, like if I look at jumping, plyometrics, whatever we want to call it, as body weight power or unloaded power, what does loaded power look like for someone who can't Olympic lift? And that's so, maybe it is, we've been playing around with our just jump, our, you know, our jump mat with, um, with, you know, dumbbell jumps and trap bar jumps and trying to look and figure out kind of where's the sweet spot for those lifts in terms of power production. So that's kind of my, my new area of thought. Yeah, no, that's a, that's, I mean, we almost use that exclusively, but I, I think, I don't know where it ends for me, like where it begins, where it ends for me on uh, power development versus just someone's ability to pick it up. Like if, uh, for me, I want to be able to teach an exercise in under 60 seconds. So, or I want them to be able to understand the exercise and perform it in under 60 seconds if, I, if I'm explaining it. So, um, so that they can feel, you know, like I don't want to sit there and have to coach it for a half an hour and then be like, oh, okay, well, now try, you know. Uh, and I think that's, that's what we do. Like with, we have our Olympic lifting progression kind of broken down that way where we feel like we should realistically – you should be able to get the average kid doing something that looks like a hand clean the first day you see them in 10 minutes. That's that's our goal. If you can have something like, and I always say the objective, something that looks like a clean, we'll be okay. And then we're going to do that twice a week for 10 weeks. Usually if we have a kid, we're going to have that little 10-minute block. And I do think much like whatever, you know, other things that people line, agility, ladder work, there are things that are good for kids that maybe – other people look and say, oh, that's not good for athletes. That's not. 
But when you're looking at kids who, who lack basic coordinated function, like I love the idea of Olympic lifting. It's like jump up, sit down, jump up, go down. There's a really, there's a lot of stuff going on in Olympic lifting and I feel like it's all good. As, and we're teaching, I mean, we have some kids, we always, uh, you know, I, I think motor moron is maybe not the nicest, nicest term, but we have some kids that fall in that category. I was to kids with questionable nervous systems. How's that? And, um, and we get those kids for Olympic lift. Sometimes there are some of these kids that who start out in the beginning, you think, Oh my God, this will never happen. And it always happens. Yeah. So, well, that's the thing. That's the weird thing about strength conditioning. It's just like when I, when you get these kids that, this seem like, oh, this kid will never, you know, and he starts lifting and they just transform in front of your eyes. It's insane. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I just, I said, I pulled out some stuff, but um, George Cavajal, who's a, a guy that I follow on Twitter, you know, he's a pretty good coach down in Florida. One of the things that he said the other day was, and I'm going to read it for you. He said, for years, I didn't Olympic lift my athletes because of the time it takes to teach the proper Olympic mechanics, especially in the short NFL off season. Then I realized that's exactly what my job is to teach them properly in that window. And I was that way about deadlifts. For a long time, we didn't deadlift. And I'd always say, well, people just don't deadlift right. So I don't like deadlifts. And then one day, I was reading this article by uh, Barry Ross, who's Allison Felix's coach, if you follow Olympic sprinting. But And one of the things that Barry Ross said was that deadlifting is better for you than squatting because deadlifting involves far more musculature. When you start looking at like grip musculature, upper back musculature. And I remember reading it thinking, Darn, he's right. And I really don't like everybody doing deadlifts, but he's pretty right. Yeah, as long as you can hinge back into it. Dan, right. Back yeah, and then we went back to trap bar. Yeah. But you don't really have to hinge. Right. With trap bar, like I looked at trap bar and said, you can yeah. basically trap bar squat. Yeah. From and a yeah, mechanical standpoint. Forgiveness. You, your knee right. can stay forward. Just that, that sometimes that half inch to two inches is like, you know, it's, it's just like a godsend to, the per, to a person's low back that was just yeah. kind of. But yet you get the grip and the upper back benefit. And suddenly I, I was forced to accept a lift that for years I had said, ah, uh, we're not going to do that because when people do it, it's always ugly. And then I thought, well, it's always ugly because I let it be ugly. It's always ugly because I don't mandate that it's not going to be ugly. I don't mandate that from start to finish, you have to be a good deadlifter. And if I let you kind of break form on the first lift and, slam the plates off the ground and bounce it back up again around your back. That's my fault. Yeah. That's not the deadlift's fault. So I think we started to look at, at more things that way in terms of, okay, let's, and this, that's, you know, some people might say that, well, that means there's no bad lifts. And I'm like, no, there are other lifts that I might look at and think, I don't like barbell. We do no barbell deadlifts, zero. Yeah. I, I think that just, because as you said, there's, you're, you're analyzing the, the pros and cons of the scenario, you know, like, uh, well, and, and you realize that barbell, you know, people always say, oh, barbell deadlifting, you know, it's like the cross thing. Oh, you know, you got to wear high socks because you tear up your shins. And I'm like, or you could just buy a trap bar. And yeah. then you can wear normal person socks and not worry about bleeding all over the gym. It's, right. it's, it's, it's absolutely your choice. Yeah. No, I completely agree. I think, uh, like, we haven't, I, I used to try to just beat my head against the wall trying to teach people how to conventional deadlift for the barbell. And now, I mean, we're just basically exclusive. If you're going to go with your feet narrow, we're going exclusive with the trap bar. And we almost never go beyond sumo with the, with the barbell. Yeah. I mean, we go sumo kettlebell to teach yeah. everybody in the beginning. Everybody kettlebell deadlifts. And, our, again, our rule is basically don't worry about it. Don't give them the trap bar until they can kettlebell deadlift the heaviest kettlebell. And yeah. we just kept buying heavier kettlebells. Like, I don't even know what we have. We've got, we've got over 100-pound kettlebells. So yeah. by the time someone gets to deadlift, it's not it's not a huge transition for them to be yeah. able to do that. And and yeah. so I think there's a lot of just common sense. Yeah. I really like adding the the second kettlebell in there too. When you go like if you've only if you only have kettlebells up to twenty four kilograms, let's say, and you're gonna buy that thirty two. So you go to buy a thirty two, they max out on thirty two. Well then go back down to the twenty four, hit the hit that for forty eight. There's something different about having two kettlebells in your hands. Yeah. Oh, there is. I think it's a lot. It had, it's a, it creates people have to get a little bit wider. They have to be maybe a little more squat stance. And I like that because I was a sumo deadlifter. I never, I was never a good conventional deadlifter. So I was always um, drawn to sumo deadlifting because I could always squat more than I could deadlift. And I was, a, if I went to conventional deadlift, 
it was well below my squat. <laughs> well, yeah, I, some people just don't have the angle. I, like, I, I don't want to blame anything on genetics. I, I don't like it when people do that, when they're like, oh, it must be their genetics that they're fat, or it must be your genetics that you're weak, or whatever. I just think that's ridiculous. But uh, but if you do have that, you know, you're, if you have a certain type of pelvis or you have a really long femur, it's going to be hard to, you're almost going to have to lift that bar out around your knee or stick your butt up in the air to be able to, to deadlift that up from conventional. Right. And, and, and I said, there may be a difference between genetics and anthropometrics in terms of, I have a really good um, slide that I use in my presentations of two girls that trained at our gym who I have a picture of them both sitting down. So they're both sitting on 12 inch boxes. They're the same height. Yeah. Stand up. One of them is a foot taller than the other when they stand up and just to show people Look at the spines are identical length. Yeah. The difference is in, primarily almost exclusively in femurs. Yeah. Although there are 12 inches difference between the two of them, between tibia and femur. In one case, it's about three inches of tibia and about nine inches of femur. Is it really? Wow. That's quite a difference. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, it's really like 5'11 and 5'1. Yeah, we always uh, we always joke in here. Uh, Rachel, my significant other, she's six foot tall. I'm six foot four, but our hips are about this far apart. Like, I mean, she's yeah. probably not even an inch. If you go right off of that ischial crest, we're just almost the same. It's uh, yeah, it's kind of amazing. So, like, just that genetic variance from person to person, I just yeah. uh, it it just gives more credence to the the trap bar versus the barbell on a deadlift. And even why, like I use it also, it's why some people shouldn't squat. I mean, it's why some basketball players, some offensive linemen, you get some people who just are not good squatters. Yeah. And I always say you're never going to make them. If they've got that super long femur, you'll never make that person a good squatter. You can try, yeah. but they'll never be as good. I, and I always I, – I, I have my standard jokes. You know, what does someone who wants you to squat usually look like? And the answer is squatty. You know, if you <laughs> – then they would be squatty like oh yeah he's a squatty person yeah and he's the one who's always telling you that everybody should squat and you're like yeah that's because you're squatty yeah you're like, lanky, job, he's a squatter yeah yeah. Like, yeah if you were lanky you know, the lanky guy never argues with you about squatting he never says oh why can't we back squat right never yeah there you go all right well um my, uh, Coach, this is like incredible to have you on. I gotta, I gotta get going here in just a second because I, uh, I got clients coming in. But um, is there anything else like uh, before before we sign off? This has been fantastic. Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Is there anything else you want to kind of leave the grit gym crowd with the uh, before we jet out? Um, yeah, I think uh, yeah, I'll leave you with two two thoughts at least. The gym, the grit gym crowd, your people. You know that ninety percent. One, I always talk about. I wrote an article one time called "Only One Body." And the reality is, it, I use the analogy of a car. I said, when, if you're 16 and your parents gave you a car and said, Adam, this is it. This is the car. And you only get one car your whole life. You'd be really, really good to that car. Yeah. Yet people don't do that with their body. They don't look at it and think, wow, this is it. You know, People think the parts are interchangeable. Oh, I'll just go get a new knee. I'll just go get a new hip. I, whenever I have anybody say, so I'm going to have my knee replaced, I tell them, do you do realize they're going to cut your leg off in two places, right? Did they explain that part to you before? And so I think that's a really big piece. And the other thing, I wrote another article called Does It Hurt? And I always say to everybody, if I ask you, does something hurt, you can only answer yes or no. So it's, training is so simple. When someone's, Can someone do that exercise? I got to know. Have them do it. Then ask them, does that hurt? And if it doesn't, then they can do that exercise. If they say anything besides no, that's yes. When they say stuff like, Oh, it's not bad, or it's okay, or after I warm up, I'm like, those are all, those are all yeses. And in the in the adult fitness world, we have to get good at looking. I I use the I have to, I should know who the is from, but I can't, it says um, what you do speak so loudly I can't hear what you say. So I have to look at people all the time and say, I, I tell our coaches, watch the clients, the client that's walking around rubbing their shoulder or rubbing their neck or rubbing their back is lying to you about yeah. how, how that lift is reacting yeah. with their body. They're, they're lying. So that would be the stuff. Yeah. What's that? Sorry, I missed the last part there. Right, so that's the stuff that I'd leave you with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. Like, uh, like people, I, I think, like, you've been conditioned your whole life to be like, oh, no, I'm tough. I'm tough. Yeah. 
It's like, well, that's not tough. That's just stupid. I, I played the, I, I've towed that line between tough and stupid for a lot of years. I know, I know what it ends up with. It ends up with a hip. It ends up with a knee. It ends up with a foot where I couldn't walk for a year. You know, it ends up with a shoulder. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's no fun. And exactly. in this thing, you're in it for help. I, I think that's what you're saying with the, with the car analogy, right? Yeah, that's exactly. Is that we're, our job is to make people feel better. It's really not to make them at this stage in your adult groups. It's not about getting bigger or stronger or faster. It's about feeling better. It's about, living a longer better life yeah not uh my friend ben bruno wrote uh, his 10 commandments the other day look if you look on instagram it's pretty funny one of the things he says, like no one cares how much you bench yeah. so just do it right yeah. you know if you go i always said if you go to a party and you talk to people about how much you lift you're a loser yeah okay <laughs> like, that's reality. like no one cares yeah no one's inviting you back the next time yeah wow yeah. <laughs> All right, Mike. Well, thanks for being on here. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This was fantastic. But uh, guys, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, please click the like button and the share button. Send this out to everybody you know. This is fantastic. This is uh, uh, free information that is seriously priceless. So uh, please share it out to everybody you know. Thanks for being here, Coach. I really appreciate it. All right, no problem. I'm going to click stop and I'll be out of here. See ya. See ya.